In this episode of Trek in Time, we're going to be talking about identifying when you're having an impact. That's right, we're talking about Star Trek Strange New Worlds Season 2, Episode 6, Lost in Translation. Welcome everybody to Trek in Time, where we're watching every episode of Star Trek in chronological order according to star date. And we're also taking a look at the world at the time of original broadcast. So we're currently looking at Strange New Worlds, which means we're also looking at just last year, 2023. But that won't last for long. We're just a handful of episodes away from jumping back to the original series. So it's going to be quite a timey-wimey transition. And who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And with me, as always, is my brother, Matt. He is the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel, Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Matt, how are you today? I'm doing great. I actually... um. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up, but I will. Just got a dog. Sean knows this. And mm -hmm. we adopted a rescue. She's two years old. And we have a two-year-old cat. And on both their like the certificates that we got, Sean's going to find this funny, they have the same birthday. <laughs> yes. That's so weird. I've been, I've been joking with my wife that it's like the movie Twins. We have Dane DeVito <laughs> and Arnold Schwarzenegger and they're twins. Yes. Um, but it's been a little bit of an adjustment period over the past week because we've had her for one week. And the big concern was how she can be with the cat. And she's actually great with the cat. The cat's kind of not so great with the dog. Um, st stalking the dog, which is not great, but uh, it's been an interesting experience so far. I inadvertently, uh, for unrelated reasons, I called Matt like 30 minutes after he had gotten the dog and had just brought her home. And I was talking to him about a different subject. And then he said, well, we just brought the dog home. Do you want to see her? I can put you on FaceTime. He put us on FaceTime and saw the dog walking around with what looked like a very, very clearly distressed face. Yeah. Because she was like 30 minutes in this house. And she's like, I don't know where I am. What the heck am I doing here? And four feet behind her is this <laughs> entirely black cat with a tail <laughs> that looks like it's about 12 inches around. <laughs> Yes. And wherever the dog went, the cat was just very quietly right behind her, staying within four feet. And I was just like, Luna, you're going to be fine if you just back the frick up. <laughs> just <laughs> leave the dog alone. Yeah. And then more recently, Matt shared a photo of the dog eating its dinner and sitting right next to the dog watching the dog eat the dinner is the cat. But she looked very calm. So it looked like things are progressing in a good direction. Yeah, it is progressing, but it's it's interesting to see how they're, as Willow, the dog, gets a little more comfortable in the house, it's interesting to see the dynamic slowly shifting. <laughs> so it's six months from now. I don't know where we'll be, but it should be interesting. Well, six months from now, hopefully they'll be best friends. As we get into our conversation about this week's episode, we always like to start off with comments from our previous episode. So Matt, what have you found in the mailbag for us this week? Okay. A lot of good stuff, Sean, this one. <laughs> Last week, we talked about charades, episode 136. Sean, to say he hated this episode would be an understatement. Um, I don't know if my opinion came through clearly, but it's like I really enjoyed the humor and the acting and all that kind of stuff, but I thought the story was kind of like weak. So for me, it was like a nothing burger, but Sean, he actually hated it. The comments were divisive. People liked it. People hated it. But I was surprised at the number of people that said they love this episode. So let me let me go through some mm. of the kind of cherry picked. There were so many I wanted to put in here, Sean, but of course I couldn't put them all. Uh, one from uh, Fres Marco seventy eight wrote, "Yeah, there was definitely more of a comedic take on things, and it really shouldn't be tried to compare it to more serious episodes. So maybe lighten up <laughs> just a little bit. But I can understand that perhaps the style of comedy is not your cup of tea." I love that because you get the joke, Sean, because in the episode, the whole Vulcan tea ceremony. Yes. <laughs> uh, I just got to tip my hat to uh, Marco for that one. That, thank you very much. Uh, then there was one from Way Outs that uh, said, I just took this episode as stepdad Pike did what he can for his kids. It shows again why Spock stole the ship and risked his career and life to take uh, to help for, to take Pike in the menagerie. Sarek may be father, but Pike is dad. Anson Mount was hilarious in this. I agree completely. Also, it's another episode showing just how good the cast is. The acting saved a crappy episode. Yes. That to me was kind of like, 
that's a good summary for how I felt too. It's a kind of a crappy episode, but I had a good time watching it just because the acting was so much fun. Um, but then there was a long comment. I'm not gonna read the whole comment, but uh, happy flappy farm. Go to the comments on YouTube and read this because it's really good. I'll try to summarize it. But what is happening? This was a fun romp, break from the serious, a new take on an old theme with the Star Trek New Worlds cast. We love this episode. All the comic relief, watching Spock eating too much, acting like a teenager, being spontaneously emotional, and being taught how to be wooden-faced with a raised eyebrow by Erica Ortegas, of all people. What? My husband and I were laughing out loud constantly. She went through the whole thing about like all the stuff that she loved about the episode. And I thought it was a great summary of why an episode like this would resonate so positively to some people. And this PS is a reference to something I said to you, Sean, when we started this show. The PS on here, Sean, you're going to really enjoy because she also wrote, looking forward to Sean's next book, pre-ordered it today. I read Sinister Secrets of Singe three times. Great book. Oh, so, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Flappy. Uh, I will. I will say, in response to like taking a break from the serious, like everything you're describing, I I can see all of that, and I do appreciate the previous comment. Also, also pointing out the performances here are fantastic. I'm inclined by persona, <laughs> the hardest nugget of Sean that is in Sean. I'm not inclined to certain types of romantic comedy. And I feel like this episode skewed toward that zone of romantic comedy. But I also understand that a well done romantic comedy is not easy. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think there's there's that side of it. And another side of it is. I think there's a I've begun to wonder about that episode in particular, if audience experience collectively adds to the enjoyment in the same way that seeing a movie in a theater feels great when there's a lot of audience response and you realize you're kind of swelling up with the rest of the audience and laughing or screaming at the right moments that collective experience and i wonder if matt and i had watched this in the same room if i might not have enjoyed it more because i would yeah. have enjoyed it through his enjoyment and we would have been having a good time together so I, in watching it by myself in a dark room early in the morning on a Friday, and like, this is how I'm starting my day. <laughs> like, it didn't hit the right note. And I'm, and I'm curious, like, uh, happy you're describing a kind of collective experience. And I think that's fantastic. So like, I, I don't, anybody who enjoys this episode, I'm not critical of your enjoyment of it at all. I think it's fantastic that you're enjoying it from one perspective in particular, we only have so many episodes of a show that we love. Wouldn't I want every single episode to be enjoyable yeah. for every single audience member? So if, if I'm enjoying 85% of the show and you're enjoying a hundred percent of the show, I'm so happy for you because that's yeah. like, that is the goal for all of us. So, uh, so I appreciate your perspective. Thank you so much. And thank you for the support for buying my books. Uh, also to add on to that, I watched, when I watched that episode, my wife was half watching it. She was doing some chores in the kitchen, but she was watching it and she was belly laughing herself. So it's like, I had that communal experience that may have helped me as well. Mm -hmm. The fact that both of us were laughing and kind of egging each other on. So yeah, maybe don't watch it by yourself, Sean. Yeah. Um, I, I anyway. was flashing back as I was talking to, to my movie going experience of having seen the movie. Nope. I saw it in a full yeah. theater. I saw it in a packed theater. And the experience of seeing that in a theater, I cannot imagine that I would have, I, I know I would have loved the movie regardless of where I saw it, but I left the theater so jazzed on adrenaline after seeing that movie. And I know that a huge portion of that was because I just saw it with an audience that was responding to everything that was going on on screen, viscerally. Everybody was shouting back at the screen. And I, I had never been in a movie going experience like that. So audience participation, audience experience mm -hmm. is such a big part of all of this. So another, there were other comments like Dr. Uh, J2U2 wrote, it's my favorite episode of Star Trek Tr Strange New Worlds. Oh, well. So <laughs> hey, doctor, don't say, oh, well, enjoy yeah. it. Um, enjoy like it. Like Sean said, it's like, 
yeah, just own it that you'll like it. I'm great. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you, you loved it. Uh, but the last comment I want to bring up, and this is something I brought up to you when we were in Strange New Worlds, and it was one of the first, I think it was one of the first Spock romantic story episodes where you were kind of like, I don't know about this. And you were kind of like not digging it. Um, and I said to you, oh, Sean, there's an episode coming up in season two that's going to be kind of a doozy. Um, going to be really interesting to see what you think of it. Well, Eric Dunn wrote, I cannot wait until you get to episode nine. Your brotherly interactions with each other had me laughing. Mm. Episode nine, Sean, is the one I was referring to. So okay. strap yourself in. Just know okay. when we get to episode nine, go in knowing, oh boy. <laughs> Something's going to happen here. Yeah. Okay. The, yes. The entire premise warned. of the episode is quite a doozy. So strap yourself in. Looking forward to not looking forward to it. <laughs> that noise in the background, of course, is the read alert, which can mean it's time for Matt to buckle up and read the Wikipedia description. Matt, best of luck. Okay. The Enterprise joins the USS Farragut to repair a deuterium refinery. Ensign Natoya Uhura begins experiencing hallucinations of strange noises and frightening images, including the deaths of her parents and a of former Enterprise engineer, Hemmer. Pelia discovers that the refinery has been sabotaged. Saul Ramon, the officer responsible for the sabotage, is taken to sickbay. He exhibits symptoms similar to Yuhura's. Ramon escapes sickbay and attempts to sabotage the Enterprise. <laughs> right. Matter of fact, very declarative Uhura sentences. <laughs> yes. Yuhura pursues him and unsuccessfully attempts to calm him down. James Kirk, visiting from the Farragut, rescues her before Ramon is blown away into space by an explosion. Yuhura dis does this feel like a second graders book report to you? Because it, it kind of does. Yeah. Kinda does it, feels, it feels almost like it's a picture book version of the episode. <laughs> yeah. like, turn the page. Yuhura, <laughs> yes. Yuhura discusses her hallucinations with Kirk, and he helps her realize that she needs to confront her grief about her parents and Hemmer rather than ignoring it. With the help of Kirk and his brother, Sam, a xenoanthropologist, Yuhura realizes that her hallucinations are messages from aliens who live in the deuterium and are being killed by the refinery. She reports her theory to Pike, and he orders the refinery destroyed. Yuhura later introduces James Kirk to Spock. <laughs> oh I'm sorry. Sometimes these Wikipedia descriptions are so bad. <laughs> That one is wow. a Wikipedia description uh, communicated via telegram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Enterprise joins the USS Farragut to repair a deuterium refinery. Stop. Ensign and Toya Yuhura <laughs> begins experiencing hallucinations. Stop. This is episode number six. Lost in translation. Dan Liu directed Anitra Johnson and David Reed were the screenwriters and this originally broadcast on July 20th, 2023. We have, as always, the, this is effectively a bottle episode. Um, we have Anson Mount, Ethan Peck, Christina Chong, Melissa Navia, Rebecca Romaine, Jess Bush, Celia Rose Gooding, who does a remarkable job in this episode. I think she's very, very good in it. And Babsel Smokun and Paul Wesley returns as Captain James T. Kirk although he's not Captain James T. Kirk. That is how he's listed in the IMDP page, which I think is very funny because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, he's, of course he's Captain Kirk. No, no, he's Lieutenant Kirk. Bruce Horak returns as Hemmer, and Dan Janat is, once again, Lieutenant George Samuel Sam Kirk, and Carol Kane returns as Pelia. I like in the Wikipedia description also, it just says Pelia did this, and it doesn't describe who Pelia is. So... Yeah. It's like just a but bunch for, of random but for names Sam, jumping in. He's a xenoanthropologist. He's a xenoanthropologist. Don't out. forget that. Yeah. And what was the world like at the time of original broadcast? This was on July 20th, 2023. And Matt, you'll be surprised to find out that you were no longer at this moment uh, boogieing along to Last Night by Morgan Whalen. I know you were enjoying that song very, very much. But this week, what you were dancing along to was vampire by olivia rodrigo yes that's right you were one of 35 million people downloading that song again and again and again and again and at the movies people were lining up to see a little film that nobody knew if this film would actually have the chutzpah to reach very high in the box office charts but 
it persevered and it was able to break through. Yes, I'm talking about Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, which in its opening week earned $54 million at the box office. And on television, we've been talking about streaming programs, comparing apples to apples as much as we can. So up to this point, we've talked about Suits, Bluey, NCIS, Grey's Anatomy, Coco Melon, and this week, a little show called The Big Bang Theory, which is available on Max. It's 281 episodes, totaled a 27 billion minutes viewed. I think it's fascinating that here once again with Coco Melon, one step above it with only 22 episodes, had 36 billion minutes viewed. So it's a steep drop off to get to number six. And it's Big Bang Theory, one of the most successful sitcoms of the past couple of decades. And in the news, the New York Times headlines included Russia in its continuing war in Ukraine uh, was beginning to attack grain ports and threatening ships that were headed to Ukraine, which was potentially expanding the war in questionable ways. And in China, China's premier rebuffed our President Biden's climate advisor, John Kerry, Kerry had called for China to respond faster to climate action, and Premier Xi responded to rebuff that. And also in China, former Secretary of State Kissinger had visited China and was warmly met. And there were also analyses of the recession, which never appeared. So there were questions beginning to emerge of, were we ever headed into a recession? It, and what role did inflation at this point have in rebuffing or increasing concerns about recession? On now to our discussion of this week's episode. To me, and I'm just going to say this and then invite you to respond if you had a slightly different take or a very different take. Uh, to me, this episode was all about recognizing when you're having an impact. I saw the multiple storylines around Uhura, uh, Kirk, Spock, and Nurse Chapel, Hammers no longer being present on the crew. All of these, to me, felt like they were opportunities to evaluate the impact you have on other people around you and how you may or may not recognize it in the moment. As a theme, did that seem to be what was coming through to you, or was there a different nuance to this for you? Uh, for me, it was more about recognizing uh, kind of unconscious impacts on your emotional well-being and how it impacts your decision making. Um, because every interesting, character, it's almost the inverse of what I said. It's almost correct. like mine was inward looking, and yours is outward looking. That's interesting. Yeah, exactly. That's what I took away because so all the different things like that we're going to talk about uh, kind of played into that of people kind of recognizing how, what things had impacted them in their decision making because they were kind of in denial about it in some fashion or not mm -hmm. recognizing it. Mm -hmm. I have a list here of the various storylines. To me, the prime storyline, and I think this is a good example of an episode that thematically all of these things wove together beautifully so that it didn't feel like we had a plot A and a plot B that needed to be married by the end. It felt very much like they were all plot A, but subsets of plot A. So they're mm -hmm. very close to each other. But to me, Uhura is the main focus. And so I'd like to start with her and examine her storyline in the most detail and the dealing with grief, the echoes of the echoes of grief and the unexpected rising of grief. I had a, I, a personal experience that felt sort of similar to some of the themes of this episode. Um, when I was a junior in high school, so I would have been like 17. Matt's and my grandfather passed away and we went to the funeral. We went and were with our grandmother and dealt with it as a family. And there was never a point where it was anything was put like intentionally repressed or pushed away. There was, there was nothing like that. There was no strife in that regard. 
but it was nearly four years later, maybe four and a half years later, I was in college and I watched an episode of, of all things, the wonder years in which the main character of the wonder years, Arnold goes on a road trip with his grandfather who's getting older. And by the end of the episode, his grandfather gives him his car, gives Arnold his car because it has come to his attention. He's like, I'm getting too old to be able to drive safely. And it's kind of a road trip. It's like a mini version of a road trip story of two characters not getting along well at the beginning. They don't really know each other. By the end, they've formed a bond that you're going to tell is going to resonate forward. And Wonder Years was just a show at that time that I liked having it on in the background. If, if a new episode was on, I'd have it on in the background while I was doing some, some schoolwork and that kind of thing. And by the end of the episode, I was sitting in my dorm room and I was crying my eyes out unexpectedly. <laughs> yeah. And it hit me like a lightning bolt. I was suddenly just absolutely weeping. And for a half a second, I thought, what is going on? And then it quickly surfaced like, oh, this is about my grandfather. This <laughs> is a well of emotion I hadn't fully tapped and hadn't fully processed. And this show helped me process that. So in the Hura storyline, I saw similar techniques and, and storytelling devices around that. The metaphor of the otherworldly experience that she's having with the sound and the hallucination felt like it was representing that kind of experience of the sudden resurfer resurfacing of grief that you don't quite know what the trigger is. It's not that the sound itself is triggering the grief. The sound is the grief. The hallucinations mm -hmm. are the grief. So we end up seeing an aspect of Uhura, and this is something I, I find remarkable about this program. I was talking with my partner about this just a couple days ago. When I knew Strange New Worlds was going to be done, I anticipated that they would be leaning heavily on entirely new characters and telling stories about characters that we had not seen in any other version of Star Trek. I was aware that Spock would be a part of it. How could he not be? But then when Uhura was introduced in the very beginning, I thought, well, that's an interesting place. I don't know if it'll work. Like there was an aspect to that. I was like, how will this work? And I'm finding myself now really so impressed by their ability to take a character who I thought I knew, but knew, of course, as she's a secondary character. She's not one of the big guns of Star Trek. She's in the background, but she's involved, but she's a second tier character. And to have that, mind in the way it is and turned into the character that she is, is making me retroactively redefine what she means to me Yep. in the original series, even though we haven't gotten there yet. So I'm redefining her role on the bridge, her support of the various characters around her and the kinds of trust that they have in her as a result of the storytelling here. And if there was a class on how do you do a prequel right, this is it. This is like, yep. this show is the how do you do a prequel the right way. On the opposite end of the spectrum would be like episodes one through three of Star Wars, where some bad decision making, <laughs> is this really yeah. what we're supposed to expect happened in the past? Like the, the dissonance there. But this is doing things to these characters that I'm just like, holy cow, this having you, her dealing with grief in this way, giving her the backstory of she goes to Starfleet fleeing grief. And now in multiple episodes leading to this sort of pinnacle moment of, yeah, you can't outrun your emotions. You can't outrun your past and having it resurface in this way having her grief appear in this way really was so powerful to me that it's like i said it's redefined her character moving forward which i think is fascinating so yeah what were your thoughts about the depiction of this the 
hallucinatory quality of the kind of horror storytelling of her seeing a degraded hammer coming after her, the flashes with her family going into the crash site, which in my mind was built entirely of fantasy because I don't know that she was there. So like the aspects of all of that mixed with the quality of the sound she's hearing and the way that the the manifestation of this interaction with this alien species takes place. What did you think of the two sides of it? The emotional aspect that I talked about connecting to the future and also the storytelling technique of how it's depicted on screen. I'm right there with you on if you want to do a prequel, how do you do it right? This is a perfect example. I am giddy with excitement, Sean, to get to the original series because yeah. the way they've crafted Nurse Chapel, Spock, and Uhura has put a t- completely different spin on them that still feels true mm-hmm. to the characters that we know we're coming up to, but it's going to give me a completely different interpretation of it. And Uhura is kind of, she's kind of a background character on the show, mm-hmm. um, but she's going to have so much more weight for me now, even in those little moments. She's going to have so much more weight because of what uh, Strange New Worlds has done. Um, What the aspect, one of the things I did want to bring up, this is a perfect time to bring it up, is Strange New Worlds is a gorgeous show. Like the visuals, the way it's filmed, the cinematography, everything about it is just so beautiful. It's such a pretty show to watch. And this episode, the sound design blew me away. Um, I don't know how you're watching this, but... I've got a big like Atmos surround sound system on my TV and that sound that she heard is was overwhelming and just like the low tones and the stuff that comes out of it. Low tones on a human body, it makes you feel uncomfortable and nerved. So in the beginning, I don't know if you picked this up, but it's like it was very uncomfortable, very loud. And as the show went on, every time she heard it, the tone kind of like a little more high end started coming into it and it wasn't so oppressive. And by the yeah. time, by the end, it felt almost like a voice, even though yeah. nothing was being said, it felt less ominous. And I thought the sound design of that, whoever did it, I didn't look in the credits who did it, but like, man, tip of the hat, it was amazing. It was a character in itself for how they kind of communicated the, the horror show aspect of it, of like, oh my God, what is that? It's unnerving. Yeah. And then as as it gets unraveled and she starts to come to terms with what it's meaning and how it's communicating with her through her emotional resonance, that's how it's communicating, it becomes less ominous. It just becomes like a voice of somebody crying out for help. So it was very well done. Um, I was kind of blown away by that whole thing. And I thought in that regard for the Yura character and the stuff that she was dealing with, with Hemmer and uh, what happened to her family. It, it kind of reminded me of that episode where she didn't know if she was going to stay on board the Enterprise, where she yeah. thought she might leave Starfleet. That was like a, a key part of her character that she got. we got to watch her realize she had found her family, she had found her place. And then this episode, we're watching her basically grow into the Yoruro that we know. Like yeah. she's, she knows she's in her family in her right place, but she's coming to terms with her past and her grief and now she can finally move forward. So it's like, it's kind of a, I thought this was a great kind of like um, touchstone for the character yeah. uh, overall. It has a nice uh, key also for what's driving some of this triggering of the grief in two different characters. And in, I'm talking about Pelia, who yeah. in this, Pelia has a brief moment with Uhura in which Pelia says, like, I get you've been avoiding me because of Hammer. And then the same thing is at play with Una Chen Riley, who yep. is abrasive with Pelia. And Pelia basically picks at it until finally it breaks and is able to break through. And like, I understand you're dealing with the grief of your friend and that I'm a constant reminder that your friend is dead. And I'm sorry for that. And does all of that with a kind of Keely is an interesting character to me because she carries none of the Star Trek decorum with her. Mm-hmm. She's almost more of a character from like, you could see her fitting into a show like Voyager really well because Voyager was born of some of these people are not Starfleet. So you end up with 
like some some characterizations that are outside the norm or deep space nine where again these people aren't starfleet so why should they they carry themselves with decorum the sequence where un chen riley says you have crumbs on your uniform when <laughs> did you eat and it's and yes. she has for a good portion of the episode a big black smudge of grease on her chin that is yep. never explained it is just like it's just she's filthy she just doesn't look like she's taking care of herself um and so it's Kelia who is kind of a trigger for both of those characters the unishin riley is a little more condensed it's a smaller version of what we're talking about as the overall theme of the episode but i found it equally pleasant in dealing like being able to address grief directly in that way mm -hmm. and pelia we've talked before about like what is the key to the episode pelia provides that key in that in that final in that final sequence with Una Chen Riley, where she's like i understand you're dealing with grief and that's and that's difficult and i'm sorry for that um, while also not blaming Una Chen Riley for having that response. Yeah. She's very yeah. compassionate in that moment. And Yuhura earlier in the episode is watching videos of Hammer giving her guidance. It is resurfacing these things because something is going on. She's had this audio experience. So she's going through the process of checking her station's entire circuitry through the ship and ends up watching this video with hammer and you see the kind of relationship that they hinted was growing and that's the thing about the show is it did a nice job of showing you the first steps of the two of them becoming legitimately friends so that when you see hmm. the video of how he was with her when they were completely alone you buy it i found it mm -hmm. like very believable that hammer would be making jokes of like no not that and yeah. scaring her in that moment just to tease her I thought that was that was lovely. How did there you, is other how did you yeah, go ahead. I, I was gonna this is kind of a right turn, but like the other thing with the Uhura with Kirk, I mean, obviously Uhura and Kirk. Yeah. Uh they're they're together. Oh, this is exciting. Um, but one thing I liked about that also with her portrayal and how they wrote it, she, their introduction was not good. Like at yeah. the bar with the he she says I don't want you hitting on me. He's like, I'm not hitting on you, even yeah. though he's totally hitting on her. Yeah, and, yeah. he's totally. And the way she just moment. rebuffs him. Yeah. And then when she's having that hallucination in the hallway and it punches herself and it turns out she just decked Kirk mm -hmm. and the way Kirk responds to that by not reporting her, not taking her to the sick bay yeah. because he doesn't want her to get in trouble. He understands something's weird going on here and he wants to help her. It's yeah. like, it felt so true to Kirk and it felt so true to Yahura. And here's yeah. Yahura who's, a strong woman in the original show she's a strong commanding presence even though she doesn't say a lot or do a lot um and it was great to see that that's how she, her first interaction with her future captain yeah. actually went um and it kind of helps to show where the relationship's going to go in the future I, th I thought it was a it felt very true very um on the not, not on the nose it, it just felt very true to me I, I really did like how that was portrayed too it's I kept like I'm going to keep going back to this. Uh, I kept retroactively like <laughs> reconnecting it to the original series and saying like, yeah. like oh, oh, and just remembering moments the episode when Kirk and Uhura are becoming the playthings of the mm -hmm. aliens that are like Greek gods and force the kiss between the two of them, and her speech to him of how I'm not afraid when I know you're here. And then they have that kiss. I kept thinking about that moment. I kept thinking yep. about Kirk when he travels back in time and he meets the woman who must die in order for World War II to end the way it should. And he says to her, there's a novel in which the author argues that let me help are three words that are better than I love you. And he reveals something in this. I thought the writing of that scene where he in the hallway with Yuhura says, in the relationship with his brother, the complication comes from the fact that they were constantly chasing after their father, who was moving from assignment to assignment to assignment. And when they would complain to their mother, where is dad? Her response was, he's helping people. And for him to grow up with that as the North Star, helping people must be very important. Mm -hmm. I was like sitting 
watching this episode and getting overwhelmed by my fandom of mm -hmm. Kirk and Uhura, Kirk and his family, Kirk and his brother, the, the, the relationship that they're showing between Sam and Jim is going to make the episode where we see what happens to Sam have so much more resonance. It's already uh -huh. a powerful moment to see Kirk say like, this is my brother and he's dead and all like, and I'm like, I've lost my only brother. Like that's a powerful episode on its own. Now I'm starting to find myself like they've done such a great job of crafting two guys who really do reflect a kind of brotherly response to each other. And I'm finding yeah. myself retro, like already mourning the character because I know what's going to happen. And this episode to, to kind of like show the balance of it. I thought the humor in this episode was perfectly rendered. Sam's constant looking for his brother to own the fact that he thinks he's the favorite. And like, that's Sam's problem. Sam's problem is he thinks Jim's the favorite and yeah. he thinks Jim is outshining him. Well, that's for Sam to deal with. But Sam wants Jim to say, I'm sorry for that. And the humor that came out of all of that, but I thought was really well done. But there's, as a brother, <laughs> what I can also say from my interpretation of that, it wasn't just him trying to look for an apology from his brother. It was also, he was just looking also for Recognition. I'm proud of you. Yeah, he was looking right. for he was looking he for was Jim waiting to say I'm proud Jim of you to say, too. I'm proud of you too. Yeah. You do great. You're doing great stuff. He just wanted some kind of acknowledgement from his brother. Yeah. And there was this brother brotherly gleefulness that yeah. it came across to me that Jim knew that's what he wanted and Absolutely. was refusing to give it just yes. to needle his brother. So yes. like in all those scenes, especially when in the bar where Sam's going, uh. Uh, and they're doing the looks at each other and your goes, well, yeah. what is going on here? Yeah. It was Jim just like, I know what you're looking for. I'm not going to say it. It was yeah. just, I thought that was fantastic. It was a really it nice was dynamic. Also, and again, to take that as a way to link it to the original series, I saw that and thought that's Jim Kirk with both Spock and McCoy. Yeah. His, us, his, found family aboard the enterprise his ability to needle both of them and to use both of them as foils against each other for his mm -hmm. own enjoyment and camaraderie in that moment where he would say something and you could see that he was intentionally setting kirk up he would be intentionally setting spock up for mccoy to say something so that he could give mccoy the little glance like mm -hmm. yeah like this that's part of his I love you to his family is yes. to say like, no, I know what you want, but I'm not going to give it to you because when I don't give it to you, the connection we have right now maintains. So he's looking <laughs> for that constant reassurance. Um, and is also born of the background that he gives in this episode. We didn't have our dad around. So like not having the, I love you in the room means you have to find some other form of communicating that and it comes out yep. in this kind of like needling which uh again the performance of of um is it wesley paul wesley uh yeah paul wesley he's really i think channeling the the character while not channeling william shatner and i think that that I is great I don't know if you picked up on it, but there were some there were some sentences that he said in this episode that were very Shatner esque without being how Shatner would say a sentence and he'd put a weird pause right in the middle of a sentence mm -hmm. to make it to make an emphasis on a, on a odd part of it. Like he didn't do that. It was he was saying the whole sentence, but then he put a pause between the sentences. And put an emphasis at the beginning of the next sentence. There was like this subtlety. I don't know if you picked up. It was mm -hmm. when it was clear to me in the scene when he's in Yehura's cabin and Yura ha had fixed him and he's they're trying to piece out what's going on with her. He yeah. delivered some lines that I was like, wow, there was like a hint of Shatner in there in the yeah. way he said right. it. When he's like being... he's massaging his sore nose. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's like so it didn't come across as mockery or anything like that because of the way he did it and he made it his own, but it still felt shatner related so i was kind of like yeah. i kind of thought 
man, he is doing such a bang up job being Kirk and yeah. making it his own, but it still feels related to what Shatner did later. I, I just love that. Yeah, really well done. Moving on to what to me feels like the final thread of all of this is brief scene between Chapel and Spock, but it had a resonance that made it feel bigger than just one scene. Uh, kind mm -hmm. of like the Unishin Riley Pelia stuff was a few scenes sprinkled in here and there. If I remember correctly, this is just the one scene of the two of them playing chess. Yes. But it has beginning. a much bigger resonance and is, I, it also ties in nicely to something. If I forget to say what it ties into, Matt, remind me to point it out. The two are playing chess. Chapel is clearly distracted and Spock is trying to address the elephant in the room, which is there could be complications of a superior officer having a relationship with one of their subordinates and regulations means we have to tell Starfleet about us. And we know from previous episodes that she does not like defining a relationship and she is having a tough time here. I thought this was, again, to connect it to the original series, it had always been into my mind, oh, he was the reluctant one in the relationship. That was the struggle of their relationship. They've twisted that and turned it on its head here because he is basically in a mode of like, we're dating. And mm -hmm. she's like, I don't know if I want to call it dating and makes what I thought was they act as if it's not a good metaphor, but I thought it was a brilliant metaphor. The it's, a great metaphor. Cat. it's a great metaphor. You got this cat. It's in a box. Is it alive or is it dead? Quantum mechanics says it's neither and it's both until you look in it. And when you look, you as the looker are affecting the results. You are causing the outcome. So her saying, if we don't look at it, the cat may still be alive. Let's see how big the cat gets. And I thought, terrific metaphor. That's a really great, it encapsulates her character in this moment so well and connects to what we've seen in previous episodes of how difficult it is for her to navigate this kind of relationship. And we've seen in the previous episode, she was even thinking of leaving the ship in order mm -hmm. to get away from this until finally everything broke between uh spock and his betrothal and now his openness to like maybe exploring a different side of a romantic relationship than he had expected very small scene but it felt like a huge rock into a small pond to me how did it feel to you oh it's same thing it was it also felt true to chapel's character because they had established in season one and stuff like that that she didn't stay in relationships that she's had problems with relationships that they always tend to fizzle out and she tends to walk away from them. So they've already established that as her MO. So when she's giving this whole, let's not define what we're doing, let's just kind of enjoy it and be in the moment, it, it was very true to her. And I, I did like the way that they've twisted it and made it that Spock is all in on this. He's like, yeah, let's do this. But she's the one that's kind of keeping it on the fringe. At arm's length, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, thought it was, I thought it was a very great resonant scene. And also it was a, just a great, here's just a... 90 second scene to kind of keep that storyline going and then we won't talk about it for the rest of the episode so i thought it was yeah. just a nice way to kind of even though this is a bottle episode they were trying to kind of continue that thread going just with like a little hop a skip and a jump i thought that was good too yeah the other thing i wanted to mention that it tied into for me uh when yuhura goes to the bar and meets kirk for the first time he's been watching their game yes yeah and I absolutely adored his, like, he's got to guard his rook. He's, he was three moves from checkmate. Um, and the reference being that Kirk is one of the only people who can beat Spock. And that's mm -hmm. something from the original series as well. Like I'm little moments like that send electricity up my spine in a way that probably isn't psychologically healthy. And so I'd like to... <laughs> Bring it all back around <laughs> to the final closing shot in which we see, as Wikipedia put it so succinctly, Yuhura introduces Kirk to Spock. Like, Wikipedia would have you believe that, that it was just like a, like a perfunctory thing, but it was a bigger moment. And I found myself, I am brave enough to admit it, I was getting weepy 
at the moment. <laughs> That's who I am. I'm not going to apologize yeah. for it. I'm sitting there watching Own it, it and I was just like, I'm just Own like, it. holy cow, I'm starting to get emotionally moved at this moment, seeing the two of them meet each other for the first time. I thought it was a terrific closing to the episode uh, because of the resonance of what their meeting means to the larger storyline, the larger fandom. But as the camera, I thought they did a fantastic job. The director did a terrific choice here. Not resting on them at the table backing mm -hmm. out of the room and making the importance of their meeting about the larger scope because the camera moves backward out of the bar and you see the larger group of people in the room and who you see is a wide assortment of humans and aliens that are all working together in starfleet one of the yep. the key things of this shot for me was like they are really putting a nice point on what is the role of these three in the larger picture? It is in support of this larger effort of the community of Starfleet and the Federation and what that means, the collective working toward a common goal. And I thought it really resonated for me in that closing moment. I think that's part of what swept me up into it. Like, it's not just about the three of them. It's not just about Kirk and Spock. It's about what Kirk and Spock represent within the larger picture. Yeah, I felt the same way, but there's like a difference in how I interpreted it as it was going back. It was, I like that they pulled it back and we couldn't hear what they were talking about anymore. We could just yeah. see the body language. But as it's pulling back, it felt like, it it looks like a completely inconsequential meeting. Just people yeah. hanging out, having a drink or schmoozing, whatever. It's like, mm -hmm. but we know that that group is going to play a very big role in what's going to come in the coming decades. So it's like, it starts small, but it's going to get big people. Um, that, that's kind of how I looked at it. So it, I wouldn't say I got weepy, but I was just like, you know, little kid in a candy store. Like, this is awesome. I was loving every minute of that. So thank you everybody for hanging out with us and listening to me talk about how often I cry when I'm watching television. The episode entitled Those Old Scientists, please jump into the comments and let us know what you think the episode is going to be about. And don't forget, wrong answers only. Before we sign off, Matt, is there anything you'd like to share about what you have coming up on your main channel? Yeah, sure. Um, I have an episode out that's out right now about thermal energy storage. I've done videos about this before, like gigantic sand batteries that are for like utility scale energy storage of heat and reusing it later. There's actually options for this that are now hitting the home market that you can get these thermal energy batteries that are sand batteries for your house. Um, very interesting. Um, will it work? <laughs> Jury's out. But check out the video. I thought it was a very interesting topic. As for me, check out my website, seanfarrell.com. You can find more information about my writing there. You can also go directly to whatever bookstore you like to use. My books are available everywhere. And don't forget, coming out in June, that's June of 2024, uh, my second book in the Sinister Secrets series is coming out, The Sinister Secrets of the Fabulous Nothings which is available for pre-order now. I've said this before, I'll say it again. Uh, Pre-orders really matter for an author and it, purchasing a book is great to support your author, but pre-ordering your book to support that author can do even more. So if you're interested in supporting me directly, please do pre-order my book. If you'd like to support the show, please consider leaving a review wherever it was you found this, don't forget to subscribe and please do share it with your friends. All of those are great and easy ways for you to support the podcast. And if you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show, click the become a supporter button. It allows you to throw some coins at our heads. We appreciate the welts. And then we get down to the difficult business of talking about Star Trek and supporting us directly will also make you an ensign, which means you will be automatically subscribed to our second podcast out of time in which we talk about things that don't fit within the confines of this program. So sometimes it's other sci-fi or horror, fantasy, whatever it is that's catching our eye. Thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time to watch or listen, and we'll talk to you next time.